Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Today we're taking a look at this original double-barreled wheel lock pistol. This is an incredibly scarce, documented, superposed barrel Saxon wheel lock pistol, formerly of the Saxon Electoral Armories Dresden. This is reportedly the only example of a multi-shot pistol of its type. Manufactured circa 1600 to 1610 in Saxony, likely by one of the talented Dresden gunsmiths who manufactured fine arms for the electors of Saxony, including Prince Christian II. The scrimshaw designs, pear-shaped pommel, and engraving designs match known pistols manufactured in Dresden by Hans Stockman and Hans Flesher and follows similar patterns to the pistols used by the elector of Saxony, Christian II's guard in the first decade of the 17th century. This piece is absolutely a piece of history and a piece of muzzle-loading art. You don't see something like this all the time. And when, uh, when I was reading about it, I, I didn't expect this. In person, it's just an incredible feat of engineering and uh, of art. Wheel locks in general, at least the, the high art ones that we have the opportunity to see here, are beautiful. It's not often though that you smash two of them together and have a fully working mechanism and a fully working, fully functional double barrel wheel lock muzzleloader. All that being said, I want to start with what is not here. And it's, it's not that it's missing from this original piece, it's that it was never included and that is a ramrod. You'll notice that nowhere in this piece do we have a space for our ramrod. Does that mean that this was more ceremonial perhaps or was the ramrod carried elsewhere? I don't know, but it's really cool. <laughs> uh, both barrels are smooth uh, to my account here. We're gonna measure these barrels real quick. Both barrels are smooth and measure out to be 50 caliber, give or take a little bit. So we have a double barreled 50 caliber wheel lock pistol. We're gonna start from the pommel end and work our way forward. Back here on the pommel, we have a beautiful carved pear shaped pommel with just an incredible selection of ivory or bone inlays here um, and some motifs in each swell here that are reminiscent of a citrus fruit perhaps or a flower petal uh, you know very common to see fruit and and flowers and flower motifs on early muzzleloaders like this one and and art forms in general uh, muzzle or art at this time and the muzzleloaders of this time often intermixed as, as far as design elements so many of the motifs that we see here you'd see on furniture on illustrations and other works of art from the time. We have a very straight wrist here. This is a very dark finished wood. Uh, I don't want to state incorrectly, but it, it seems in a way to, to look like walnut to me, at least in color, that could be stained or, or colored differently. Um, but the grain, the grain looks pretty similar to me. Like I said, I could be mistaken. Here at the base of the pommel, we have a beautiful inlaid band, really separating the wrist from the pommel. And coming up, we have a, a swan maybe, or a goose, or even like a, a mythical dragon uh, inscribed here on this thumb piece with four smaller inlays on either side forward into the back of that piece. Flipping on the underside here, we have a simple trigger guard. This is a trigger guard that's very common, at least in the wheel locks that I have seen. It's a, a simple iron trigger guard bent around. It's a rather large trigger guard. You're accommodating a trigger. It's about an inch or, or more long. And so we have a large trigger guard going around that. Almost, uh, it's a D-shaped trigger guard, very similar to like a D-shaped hilt or guard on a, on a sword or dagger that you'd find from a similar time. It's attached with two straight screws here with flat heads in them, and we have some cut motifs, flower or greenery motifs on either side of the trigger guard, 
where it is attached. The trigger plate, and very commonly on these wheel locks, is of bone or ivory, and it has some scrimshawed scrolls and hatching there as well. Flipping up to our lock plate, the lock plate accounts for most of the pistol, at least on this side. We have two independent cocks or heads here uh, for these wheel locks. They can both move freely. The engraving work, the filing work all over this is just wonderful. I was able to see the one of the Master of Castles wheel locks. And while this isn't from that maker or that group of makers, there's a lot of stylistic things here that evoke those prestigious wheel locks. We have beautiful sawn and filed edges here, scenes in the engraving. It's just, it's just incredible. I mean, this, when you think about this being a part of the electoral armory, it makes sense as to why it's so decorated and it's so beautiful. I geek out about it because you think about this being done by candlelight and by window light, and it's just incredible. The lock plate face itself is pretty plain. There are a few marks in here of detail um, and, and perhaps even a maker's mark down here that I'll show you in the close-up to give some idea of who or a group of who produced this. Our sliding pan covers here on the top of the lock both feature the faces of lions. We see double-barreled pistols later on, but we don't see many examples of an early double-barreled pistol like this one. The barrels themselves as I'm looking through here at the touch hole areas, the one is obviously set forward as you can see with this lock. So we have one touch hole back here in a, a really traditional breech area of the top barrel. And then the bottom barrel is set forward about an inch and a half or two inches here. And I believe at the same kind of breech end, although it's hard to tell from what I can see between these barrels, on this side as I look kind of down here, they look like they've been brazed or soldered, fastened together in some capacity here to keep them together. Because we have the wood stock wrapping around the entire underside here, we can't get a good look at these barrels and how they're mounted and how they're connected. But when we think about how other double barreled muzzleloaders were made later on after this piece was produced, we can kind of assume or, or theorize as to how this particular piece is put together. Moving forward from the lock here, we have two beautiful creature or serpent uh, bone or ivory inlays here with complete with scrimshaw. There's shading, there's texture, there's detail in these. It's just beautiful. Knock these out of this stock and they're little works of art on their own. And when you add them to this, entire piece and you connect it with all the other dots you have an existing canvas really of firearms technology and also just historic art as we move forward to the muzzle we have a beautiful bone or ivory nose cap here we have on the top a very traditional running leaf border that we see up into and through the winchester era um, and we have that coming back to here. It's a really old, really traditional style of border here, and uh, it looks just as good here as it does anywhere else. Again, at the muzzle here, we can see our horn or ivory nose cap. We see the, the wood of the stock here, and then we see the stacked, double-barreled, I assume to be 50 caliber by my measurements, smoothbore barrels. Now, when we look at these from the front here, you can tell the underneath side or the top side of each of these barrels has been flattened to be connected. So we don't have a full barrel width separating each of these bores. That width itself is split in two, kind of a half width on either side. And then it's, it's connected there. The bore walls look nice and clean and the muzzle ends aren't very abused. Now, the end of the stock shows some signs of wear here, but that's to be expected when you have wood right out there to the end. I'm gonna shift real quick again to the underside of this pistol, where we have a single ivory or bone plate here on the bottom side. And I want to connect this piece because we have what looks like three grapes and maybe an apple or another kind of fruit here in leaves and stems. 
And when we think about the floral or maybe citrus patterns that we see back here in the pommel, we see those motifs connecting at the front and the rear of this stock, kind of balancing out that composition. Here in the center, we have another circular floral or citrus pattern flanked on the front and rear by two smaller leaves and a small leaf on either side. Again, these motifs are artful on their own and then you add the scrimshaw or engrailing work and the beautiful color contrast between the dark wood stock and the off-white color of the inlets. It's just beautiful. Running on, along the entire underside here, we have a continuous border of bone or ivory. It's sectioned out like here we can see we have a single curve going across here to the left hand side and a smaller curve as this comes up through the right. But these inlets are tight. There's no gaps, there's no spaces. You've meshed two very natural materials here and two porous materials here and you've done it incredibly well. I'm gonna flip it around now to our side plate side or our off side. Starting at the muzzle, we have our nose cap with our border. I will say here, we have a little bit of wear on our running leaf border here on this side of the nose cap. Could that be some wear based on how it was hung or carried, perhaps on somebody's belt, and it wore on another piece of equipment or gear over time? It's hard to say, but I like to note these wear patterns because I think it can give us an indication as to how it was used. We have another beautiful serpent or fantasy creature of some sort here with complete shading and several flower and leaf motifs. As we come back towards the action area of this piece, we have what I, I think is you're coming on to one of the more beautiful inlets as featured in this piece. The proportions and the lines are so much cleaner than some of the others here, not taking away from them, but there's a a shift here as we get back into this large canvas here of these three inlets. It's, you just have so much more detail. You have so much more to look at. It's almost as if on the lock side, we're letting the eye focus and rest on the lock and the stock is kind of a, a point for your eye to rest as it moves around the piece. But on this side, it's just full bore artistic talent on full display. These serpents are really similar to those that we see in early maps and cartography and folklore or fantasy literature from the time. You know, if you've studied any art history, you've seen these kind of creatures back and forth. Um, you know, this one here almost has a wing-like texture, you know, perhaps a, a wyvern or, or maybe a dragon of some kind, depending on the local folklore. And here you have really narrow scrolls coming out of each mouth of these serpents, almost like smoke. As we look at the smoke here, I wanna make a note of how thin this is. Compared to the rest of the inlaid molding here, this is about a quarter of the thickness. And the tight scrolls and the tight inlay here, again, with no gaps, is just beautiful. As we get back here, we have this hardware or metallic section here um, on the opposite side of our lock. I wonder, uh, I can't say for certain, but I, I think that this would be our barrel selection mechanism. There's really nothing that makes me think that, that there is something like that on this other side of the lock. The lock face side is really occupied by the lock hardware. This piece has what looks like a frizzen spring out here on the front, and we can adjust this up or down, I believe, to select the action or the lock that our trigger triggers. Again, we have a single trigger assembly here. We have to assume that this single trigger can operate both locks. Otherwise, what would be the point of going through the trouble of building a double-barreled wheel lock? Coming back from that mechanism now, we have our beautiful inlaid band and our pear-shaped pommel. Flipping up now to the top face of this piece, the barrels weren't left plain. Like I said, we have a single engraved line out here at the muzzle. But as we get back here to the lock, we go from a round barrel to an octagon barrel, a motif that we see in a lot of muzzleloaders through history, especially our smoothbore muzzleloaders, as we all know. 
as we come back to the facets here, we have two sections of engraving and work here. The first section back at the locks and near the touch holes themselves, each face is marked with a small divot, a circular divot there, and then two almost crescendoing lines that separate as we go towards the muzzle. Again, acting like or, or replicating the ignition point and the spread of the shot and the projectile through the barrel represented on the barrel itself. Coming back from there, we have about an inch and a half to two inches of engraved flats here with some simple, very simple scrolls and dots and stars, but still elegant matching the rest of the engraving that we see through the piece. Coming back to the breech, we have another th triptych of these bone or ivory inlays with two faces on either side and some fruit it looks like in the center. I want to note that each of the faces have a uh, kind of a grotesque expression on them, similar to s that we see in other engraved and, and artful works from this time period going from you know, the 16 to the 1700s. But both of their ears are pointed like we would think of uh, like a Tolkien-esque elf or, or hobbit of some kind, which I think is neat to see on a piece like this. Most of the time you don't see the ears or their normal human ear, but here the artist has made a point to make these, you know, fantastic ears aligning with the fantasy serpents and creatures we see in the other inlays. Something just you don't see every day. Have to wonder about the mythology of the area of the time and then why it was represented in a practical arm for the time. A lot of the pieces we see of a similar caliber from this time period have more realistic representations through the piece, be that villages, castles, like we saw in the Master of Castles piece, or hunting of some kind, perhaps daily comings and goings of people at the time. It's neat to see an example like this with so much f fantasy element or fantastic elements as we go through it. Uh, again, the, the kind of motifs that you see in literature, in illustration and cartography from the time, kind of describing the unknown areas of the world, but it's really neat to see it on a practical piece like this double barrel wheel lock. It'd be really neat to see the sketchbooks or the journals of the maker or makers of this piece to understand a little bit their process and what went into designing this, to our knowledge, very unique pistol. I hope that you've enjoyed this abridged look at this beautiful and really interesting historic piece. If you'd like to learn more about this piece or any of the other muzzleloaders that I'm taking a look at here, you can visit the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages. They're going to show you a ton of high quality images of this piece and many more for you to learn from and study. Um, a piece like this is, I don't know, maybe once in a lifetime and it's, uh, it's neat to be able to see this. I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.